again, everyone, and welcome back to the Security Distributed System course. Uh, today, we're going to talk about key management. And uh, uh, in this lecture in particular, we're going to look at key distribution centers and certificate authorities. But let's start with talking about what problem do they solve. So last time you saw my beautiful face in one of these videos, we were talking about cryptography. Particularly, we're talking about uh, two of the goals of cryptography, confidentiality and authenticity. Let's remember that confidentiality was uh, uh, the goal of keeping secrets from leaking, and we saw how to use secret key encryption and public key encryption as solutions to this problem. And then you had the equally important but completely orthogonal uh, goal of authenticity, which is to keep data integrity against adversarial tampering. And the solutions to this problem, we saw mass authentication codes or MACs, which are a secret key uh, a solution, or digital signature schemes, which use public key infrastructure. Um, since then, you actually have seen, uh, uh, you have used these tools in several places in, in, in other topics in this course. And in particular, you have used authenticated channels, um, which are implemented using MEGs, and you have used signature schemes uh, uh, when constructing, when building uh, protocols for synchronous and asynchronous agreement. One important issue that you have not discussed in any of this uh, uh, context, but that you have been uh, um, told it will come, is how do parties get each other keys? Um, so this is a very important problem. I mean, it has been said that cryptography is a tool to turn um, any problem into a key management problem, um, because uh, 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 having uh, uh, cryptography, having encryption, having signatures, doesn't immediately solve all your problems unless you can um, uh, uh, find a way of uh, dealing the keys to the parties that need to use the key, make sure that you know who, which keys belong to which uh, individuals, and, uh, 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 and if you know how to keep these keys away from the adversary, if you don't know how to keep these keys away from the adversary, then cryptography will not help you very much. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. So the very basic solution that one might think is that, okay, um, we can just keep a shared key with everyone else. So in this figure, you have Alice and Bob, and Alice, uh, she knows a key, let's call it KAB, to indicate that this is a shared key between Alice and Bob. Um, equally, Bob has the same key, KAB, uh, which he shares with Alice. And then when Alice wants to send a message to Bob, um, she can then use this key to, in this figure, she's encrypting the message. She could be authenticating the message in the Mac uh, um, or whatever is needed for the application. Um, so this solution, so every, everyone keeping a key, a shared key with everyone else, um, might work well for two parties, but uh, definitely doesn't work in a context like the internet where you have um, millions and millions, if not billions of devices that are, uh, uh, need to talk to each other. And therefore, it's completely unrealistic to think that uh, you should keep a key for every other uh, uh, um, device or individual that you ever will communicate with. Um, this basic or trivial solution also suffers from another problem, which is that this key, uh, um, that, that Alice and Bob only have one key that they use with each other. And there is a basic principle in cryptography, um, which is uh, 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 which you will find in bold uh, in the book, and I'm also reporting it here on the slide, which is that any secret system parameters runs a greater risk of being revealed the longer time you keep it constant and the more you use it. So said in other words, if you keep using the same key over and over again, um, the probability that the adversary will learn this key uh, uh, grows. So this is both true because if the key is kept constant and there is a higher chance that the adversary might uh, you know, break into your machine and learn this key um, by, by uh, 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 the means that the adversary might have. But also since uh, uh, most cryptanalytic attacks uh, uh, benefit from having access to a larger amount of plain text and cipher text, which are encrypted with the same key. So this is not to say that you can't encrypt long messages with say a yes, I mean, we have discussed uh, heavily in, in the lectures on, on authenticity and confidentiality that, um, for instance, if you have a large file, you should encrypt the large file using symmetric cryptography. Um, you, can, you can encrypt a DVD with an AES key. Um, 
So this doesn't mean that you cannot encrypt large amount of data using uh, 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 cryptography, but the question is how, ma uh, how large amount of data should you encrypt with the same key? Uh, how long, for how long in time you should keep the same key constant and how often you should change this key. So this principle is called as key rotation. So rotating key is always a good idea. And it's a good idea because again, the more you keep a key, the higher the chances are that the adversary will get information about the key. So a very common paradigm in, in the design of uh, uh, cryptographic protocols is the one of having uh, long-term keys and session keys. So a long-term key in this case is this share key that Alice and Bob had. Let's call it again, KAV. And this key, uh, um, maybe it's a long-term key. It's a key that, that Alice and Bob share with each other and, and keep uh, a constant for, I don't know, like one year maybe, or a week or a month or, or, or whatnot. Um, but every time that uh, uh, Alice is opening a new connection to Bob um, and she wants to send some message to Bob, Alice will not use this key directly to communicate with Bob, but she will use this long-term key to negotiate a, a, a per session key, so a, a session a key which will only will be used for this particular uh, uh, communication session for, you know, for this day, for this internet connection. Uh, um, and this is a very common paradigm that allows to uh, somehow, you know, protect this long-term key by by uh, making sure that you only use this long-term key to negotiate the session keys, and then instead you use the session keys to to actually uh, uh, encrypt or authenticate the actual data. Um, so the way this works is that Alice uh, uh, she wants to communicate with Bob, she picks a, a random session key, she sends an encrypted session key under KAB. Um, Bob here decrypts this key because he has the long-term key and then he recovers the session key and then he can decrypt the message which was sent below. Um, so this is just an example of a template. This is actually not how you should be doing this. And uh, uh, in a later lecture, in a later chapter uh, about network security, you will see a uh, um, dedicated protocol for authenticated key exchange, uh, which uh, are significantly more complicated than this. So, but this is only to, uh, uh, um, uh, illustrate the uh, uh, basic principle of key rotation and the fact that you should not use the same key over and over again, but it's a good idea to, to use long-term keys to negotiate session keys, which then are used to encrypt uh, or authenticate actual data. Okay, but still, so, so, so this, this little tangent that we took, it's only about the fact that the key should not be kept constant. You still have the problem that now if you have, instead of only having two parties, you have millions of parties, uh, uh, you still have the problem how to get these session keys in place, how do long-term keys in place, how does Alice and Bob uh, in the first place get the chance to communicate with each other securely. So, so the main focus of this lecture is uh, two different solutions for scalable uh, 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 key management. So by scalable we mean that the solution should allow a large number of parties, you know, think about the internet, to securely and uh, communicate with each other. So we're going to see two different solutions. The first one is called Key Distribution Center, or KDC, which is based on secret key technology. And the second one are Certificate Authorities, or CA, uh, which uses public key solutions. So let's see how key distribution centers work. So a key distribution center is some kind of trusted authority or some trusted service that is running on your network. Um, and the setup of a key distribution center is that the key distribution center will share a key with every user in the system. This is a long-term key, which the key distribution center shares with every user in the system. Um, so in this picture, the key distribution center has a key key A that uh, uh, the key DC shares with Alice and uh, KKB that the key distribution center KDC, KDC shares with Bob. So here, important to note that the key distribution center will, if, if we had uh, n users, the key distribution center will have n keys that needs to store, but every user will only need to store one long-term key, which is the key that they share with the key distribution center. So th the solution already is much more scalable. Alice doesn't need to worry about how many users there are in the system. Alice only has a key shared with the key distribution center, and that's it. So when Alice, but then of course, I mean, Alice wants to talk to Bob, so how does this happen? When Alice wants to talk to Bob, Alice will contact the distribution center and will say, hello, I would like to talk to Bob. So this, this communication can be uh, uh, performed securely, I mean, both encrypted and uh, with confidentiality and authenticity, since Alice and the key distribution center, they share uh, 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 
this key. So, so this, this communication can be made authentic and, and, and secret. Um, so now the key distribution center will um, uh, sample some session key, KAB. Um, so this is a short-term session key, which is only for this session between Alice and Bob. And she will send this key to Alice and Bob. She can send this key to Alice and Bob encrypted under the key that the key they say the KDC shares with respectively Alice and Bob. So the both, both Alice and Bob receive an encryption of um, uh, 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 this session key encrypted under the long-term key. So now both Alice and Bob can decrypt this key and learn KAB, um, which means that now Alice and Bob can start, you know, talking to each other in a secure way um, using this session key. So in this picture, Alice is sending an encrypted uh, uh, message M to Bob. So this is, uh, uh, in a nutshell, how the key distribution center works. So let's see, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say a few words about the key distribution center. So this is a paradigm which is used in practice. Uh, for instance, Microsoft Kerberos is a, a, a real world implementation of this paradigm. There are, of course, many, many more details that, that were skipped from the previous slide, uh, which you need when you, if you want to turn that paradigm into a, 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 a actual real world solution. Um, and key distribution center are really good uh, uh, in the for scalability. I mean, we, we discussed that you know a single user, uh, uh, an individual user only needs to store one long term key share with the distribution center, and doesn't need to worry about how many users that are in the system. Um, but of course, the key distribution center represents a single point of failure, both for security and for availability. So for security, this uh, 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 this is quite important. The key distribution center generates all the session keys, which means that the key distribution center knows all of these uh, uh, session keys, which in particular means that the key distribution center will be able to decrypt or forge any uh, uh, um, communication between the parties involved. Um, so, so in other words, uh, uh, when Alice and Bobby are talking securely, they're only talking securely uh, against an adversary who is not colluding with the key distribution center. If the key distribution center gets compromised uh, um, or, or is otherwise corrupted or malicious, then Alice and Bob have absolutely no privacy and no authenticity. Um, moreover, the KDC is also a single point of failure for availability, meaning that if the distribution center is down, Alice and Bob cannot talk securely to each other because Alice and Bob don't have a mean to generate this, this uh, uh, secure key that they need to talk to each other. So those are two important single uh, uh, drawbacks of, of KDCs, uh, um, which uh, uh, um, uh, motivate why in the, we're going to talk about something else, which are certificate authorities. So the setup of a uh, um, certificate authority is uh, uh, a bit different from the setup of a KDC. So in the context of certificate authorities, you have um, uh, uh, you have here that um, the certificate authority has a public key and secret key pair for some signature scheme here called PKCA for certificate authority and SKCA, uh, um, where all the parties involved in the system, all the users in the system, they are assumed to know the public key of the certificate authority. We will later discuss how uh, uh, this is done and how, how do the users get hold of this public key. Um, the certificate authority knows its own secret key. And uh, uh, what happens here is that when a user, uh, um, when users want to talk to each other, so what happens here is that uh, uh, Alice will contact the certificate authority and get an identifier served to the certificate authority. Um, so Alice will generate her own public key and secret key uh, uh, for some encryption scheme or for some signature scheme. She will contact the certificate authority and somehow uh, identify herself. And by identifying herself, this means like physically uh, uh, um, proving her identity to the certificate authority. Um, again, we later discuss what this means. Once the certificate authority is persuaded that Alice is who she claims she is, uh, um, the certificate authority will bind the identity of Alice together with the public key PKA in what is known as a certificate. So a certificate 
is a list of uh, uh, things. But the most important thing is a signature under the secret key of the certificate authority of the identity of the user, IDA, and the public key of the user, PKA. So the identity of the user can be, depending on the context, this could be the URL of the user, like uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the, 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 the URL of your homepage. Um, it could be, um, you know, in the case of, of a, um, it could be the name of the user, it could be some other kind of identifier, it could be the, you know, uh, the, the CPR number of a user. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and this signature here binds the public key together with the identity. So in some sense here, the, the, the certificate authority's job is to uh, um, make sure that this public key and this identity belong together. Um, so the certificate authority will sign this identity and public key, and then will send back to Alice this certificate. And this certificate is, is yeah, again, the identity of Alice, the public key of Alice, together with the signature that binds the, these two things together, and a lot of other things that we will see in, in one of the uh, uh, upcoming slides. So now Alice has this certificate. And the nice thing about this certificate is that uh, she can send this certificate to Bob. Now, since we assume that Bob uh, uh, had the public key of the certificate authority, uh, Bob can verify this signature. Remember that the signature scheme uh, can be verified using the public key of, of the uh, uh, user that signed. So here, the, the certificate authority has signed this message. So Bob can verify that the signature is authentic. If the signature is authentic, then Bob will learn the public key of Alice, of Alice uh, um, and, she, and he will be able to uh, uh, then use this public key to communicate with Alice, in this case, for instance, to send a, an encrypted message to Alice under a public key. So, uh, um, so let's see the properties of a certificate authority. So first of all, uh, the main thing here to notice is that the certificate authority never learns the secret key used for this communication. So even if the certificate authority can eavesdrop this ciphertext, uh, the CA will not have the means to decrypt this ciphertext and to learn the message M. So this is a big difference between the CA and the KDC. The KDC had the session key, the KDC could uh, uh, decrypt this message. The certificate authority cannot decrypt this message. The other thing to notice is that the certificate authority doesn't need to be online when the communication happens. So Alice can go to the certificate authority uh, yesterday, um, get, get this certificate, uh, 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 collect the certificate from the CA. And now today, let's assume that the CA is offline. For some reason, the CA isn't available today. Still, Bob can still verify the certificate since uh, uh, the verification here is completely done offline, right? You just need to get the certificate, which is a, a string containing the signature, and then verify that this signature is valid under this public key of the certificate authority. And if so, you know that Alice uh, uh, had been uh, uh, identified properly by the CA, and therefore you can use uh, uh, this public key to talk to Alice. So the CA does not need to be online when the communication happens. So both of these issues uh, uh, of KDCs are great. Um, of course, it's not true that, uh, um, that the CA does not need to be trusted at all. In which sense is the certificate authority trusted? Well, the certificate authority is trust in the sense that the certificate authority must check that Alice is who she claims she is. Uh, and when she's binding this public key together with the identity of Alice, here is where we are trusting the CA to do her job correctly. In other words, a malicious certificate authority could uh, issue a certificate uh, um, for someone else uh, 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 asserting that, uh, um, uh, uh, for instance, they are me, right? So, so, so assume here the certificate authority is malicious, maybe she could give a certificate to some adversary saying that they are Alice and that's uh, uh, linked their public key to it. We'll say a few, words, a few more words about that. But first, let's look at what the certificate contains. So a certificate doesn't only contain um, the identity of the user and the public key contains also the name of the certificate owner, the name of uh, uh, which is the identity. Uh, um, it contains the name of the certificate authority who signed the certificate. It contains information about which algorithm it has been used, uh, uh, which cryptographic algorithm has been used, which method has been used to check the identity of the certificate owner. It contains information about when the certificate was issued and how long the certificate was issued for. 
It contains information about uh, the rights and privileges, about this certificate and how it can be used. Um, and of course, the most important thing, the signature on, on, on this public key. So let's see if we can uh, um, find a certificate to make a concrete example of this. Um, so let's see here, let's try to go on, for instance, the website of OS University. Um, on Chrome, you can find certificates here by um, clicking here on the lock. So the lock here says that we're using an HTTPS connection, which is something we'll be talking more about in the uh, 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 lecture, in the chapter about network security. But uh, uh, this lock means that the connection to uh, um, AUDK right now, it's a secure connection. Um, and this involves the use of a certificate. So let's see here, if I click on certificate, what happens? So if I click on certificate, um, so let's see. I think you were not be able, you were not able to see that. So let's now uh, um, try to do it again. So I'm connecting here to AUDK, and there is a lock. This lock means that the connection is secure, meaning that it's been secure using HTTPS. Again, something you will learn about later. Um, I can go here and, and, and check which certificate was used to uh, um, secure this connection. And now this little pop-up shows up. And I can see here that there is this certificate uh, um, which was issued by this certificate authority, which is known as Let's Encrypt Authority. And here I can look at the certificate. Um, you can see here in the certificate, there are all these fields we're talking about. It says something about the certificate authority, Let's Encrypt which is from the US. It says something about which algorithm has been used to sign. In this case, it's RSA encryption using SHA-256. It says something about when the uh, uh, certificate is valid from 1st September 2020 and until when. Contains the public key of the uh, um, certificate authority and it contains a signature. It also contains information about what the certificate can be used for and many other things that you can check. Contains also, for instance, here a number of uh, alternative names and shows all the names for which the certificate is valid. Um, you can go and check these on other websites and, 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 and have a little fun with it. So, okay, so let's go back to the slides. So the reason for including these fields for some of these fields is self-evident, uh, you know, like which algorithm was being used. You need the certificate needs to talk about this so that the user knows which algorithm to use to check the certificate or what can the certificate be used for. It's also important if I maybe I, I you have a certificate for a, a public key which has to be used to sign and, and this uh, uh, um, certificate should not be used to encrypt. Um, it also contains uh, this validity period. Um, and this is important both for this principle we we're talking about before this key rotation principle so you should not keep your keys constant for way too long so so you know in, in it's good to have keys uh, being uh, 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 sample and, and 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 using new keys at regular intervals and also at the same time it might be that a uh, um, uh, you know, a user might lose their secret key or the secret key might get stolen and therefore they might have to get a certificate revoked uh, um, and therefore, it's, it's important that that certificate expires. Otherwise, uh, 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 um, so the way you, you revoke a certificate is by issuing a, a revoke uh, query, and then this this the, the information that the certificate has been revoked will be published somewhere. And to make sure that this list don't just keep growing forever, uh, certificates have uh, 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 expired dates, so that this uh, ex uh, revoke certificates also can be removed from these lists. Um, so again, I already said a few words about that, but let's uh, focus more about uh, this again. So what kind of trust do you need to put in the certificate authority? The main trust that you have in the certificate authority, which is different from KDCs, is that um, for CA, you need, to, you need to trust the CA to check uh, uh, that, the, uh, um, that the user is who they, are, they, who they claim they are, and for instance, in the case of the certificate I showed you before, um, 
you need to make uh, you need to trust the certificate authority to use a uh, an appropriate method to check that the the user who registered that certificate really owned the domain au.dk it shouldn't be possible for me to get a certificate for au.dk otherwise i could impersonate a udk towards you um which you know, might not be the worst thing ever but i think of uh, uh, uh sensitive uh, uh, websites like i don't know the tax authority or or uh, your bank, uh, your email, uh, um, in all of these settings, it would be really bad if an adversary could uh, uh, could pretend, uh, 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 could serve you their homepage uh, and uh, 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 with a valid certificate, which would persuade you that they are, uh, uh, you know, Gmail or your bank or, or something like that. Um, Again, a certificate authority is less trusted than a KDC in the sense that the certificate authority does not need to see the secret keys. And, and also for availability, uh, um, the CA does not need to be involved every time a communication is established, which gives uh, 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 you know, further availability and also privacy in the sense that the CA does not need to know how often and, and you talk to uh, uh, other people or even who you talk to. Um, one problem in practice with certificate authorities is that, uh, um, you know, maybe not everyone in the world uses the same certificate authority. I, we, in the certificate we saw before, there was, it was signed by this um, CA known as Let's Encrypt. And, and, you know, in this picture, you have two users, Alice and Bob, and maybe Alice trusts some certificate authority one, uh, and Bob trusts some different certificate authority, certificate authority two. So Alice has the public key for CA1, but Bob has picked the public key for CA2. So now Alice wants to talk to Bob and she sends her certificate. Uh, uh, but this certificate has been signed under the secret key of, of CA1. Bob does not know the public key of CA1. So how does Bob uh, uh, verify this certificate? So the solution to this problem is something known as certificate chains, uh, which means that um, uh, 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 Certificate Authority 1 will uh, herself get a certificate from Certificate Authority 2 um, by doing what a user would do. So, so identifying themselves, getting a, C a certificate that binds the identity of the certificate together with the public key. Um, so that now when Alice wants to um, send the certificate to Bob, she also sends the certificate of the Certificate Authority. And now Bob can verify this chain of certificates, meaning that First, Bob will verify, Bob knows the public key of certificate authority two. So now Bob can first verify this certificate um, and be persuaded that PK uh, 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 and recover the public key of certificate authority one from this certificate and be persuaded that this is the right public key for uh, uh, this certificate authority. And now with that public key in turn, verify the uh, uh, second certificate. So, um, Let's go back to the let's go back to the uh, uh, certificate here in practice. Um, yeah, as you can see here, this is an example of a certificate chain. You have this certificate for AUDK, but you also have a certificate for Let's Encrypt, which had been uh, assigned. Um, by this other certificate authority, Digital Tr Signature Trust CO, which in this case is the root uh, of this tree. So you have that Digital Signature Trust has signed um, the certificate of Let's Encrypt, which in turn has signed the certificate of a UDK. So UDK has used Let's Encrypt to get a certificate on their own public key. Let's Encrypt has used DST. Let's Encrypt is a certificate authority and they've used DST to get a certificate on their public key. And now, of course, you know, this is this problem now is just, uh, we're just pushing the problem one level up, away, right? Uh, 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 why does my browser, so my browser trust AUDK because my browser trust Let's Encrypt and my browser trust Let's Encrypt because my browser trust DST, but why does uh, uh, my browser trust DST? Uh, and that's what we would like to talk a little bit about now. So let's go back to the slides.
Right. Um, so how do you get the public key of the first certificate authority in the first place? Um, so um, the way this works is that, uh, uh, for instance, in, in, the, in the example of my browser, simply the public key of the original um, of, of the root of this uh, uh, of the root certificate authority simply came pre-shipped. It was pre-installed with my browser. So when you download your browser, um, you know when you download Chrome from Google or when you download uh, Firefox uh, uh, from the Mozilla Foundation, or when you install Windows and 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 you get or or Mac OS and you get installed Internet Explorer or Safari, all these browsers come in with directly uh, uh, pre-installed a lot of certificate uh, uh, for root certificate authorities. Um, These certificates, for technical reasons, they also need to be signed themselves, and they usually are self-signed, meaning that they're signed. Um, the, 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 the root certificate authority signs the, the certificate using their own secret key. But of course, this uh, uh, gives no guarantee whatsoever, right? I mean, a, a certificate, anyone can sign their own certificate under their own secret key. Uh, uh, this doesn't give you any, any additional trust. It's just something which is um, needed uh, 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 for the certificate to have the right structure. The reason why you trust the certificate is not because they're self-signed. You trust them because they came with the with your installation of your operating system or with your browser. Uh, um, so who chooses who are the trusted certificate authorities? Well, those are the browsers, and and I mean the developer of the browsers. They need to decide which certificate authority they think are trustworthy, and they uh, uh, include them in the browsers. And then when you download your browser, when you install your browser, you're simply uh, um, trusting whoever is trusted by, by the people who have uh, 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 developed your browser. So not only these, right? So when you have a certificate chain, uh, um, you need to, you're really trusting all the certificate authorities in the chain. Um, so let's see, uh, um, again, how many trusted, how many certificate authorities are trusted by my browser? So what I'm going to do now depends on your operating system. Um, on macOS, on macOS, there is this uh, um, keychain um, tool, keychain tool, on which you can see all the system rules, all the certificate authorities, which come pre-installed uh, um, with your browser. And you can see here there is a long list of certificate authorities that my browser trusts, that my computer trusts. Um, simply uh, 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 to start with without thinking about it. Um, so this is, you know, you can do the, you know, you can go and look in your machine and, and look at which certificate authorities are, are trusted by your machine. And you can think about what this means in practice, right? So for instance, uh, uh, you know, let's look at these, right? Yeah, you have a certificate authority, um, the EE certification center root, um, which is some Estonian certificate authority. Um, and you can see here that, that uh, 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 you know, the reason why I should be trusting this certificate authority, you know, uh, uh, how am I, uh, uh, you, know, you know, what happens if the Estonian government, uh, uh, you know, if one day the Estonians get mad at Denmark and they want to get revenge for the, you know, uh, uh, for all the times when the Danes uh, 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 went to Estonia and, and, and conquered them, um, you know, the certificate, this certificate authority, this Estonian certificate authority might choose to uh, uh, help some, some Estonian hackers to, to you know, impersonate, um, you know, the Danish, uh, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the, the Danish tax authority or some Danish website, um, and then they could mount an attack to Danish users, right? Of course, this is a bit of a far-fetched example, but uh, uh, I think that Estonia is, in, uh, anytime soon going to attack Denmark. But you can imagine that um, there are different geopolitical equilibria that uh, make it so that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you go and look at the entire list, you might find certificate authorities from countries which you might wonder uh, uh, whether you can trust them, whether you can trust the government, um, whether you can trust whether uh, uh, their government 
isn't uh, uh, able to um, force you know some certificate authority in their country to 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 uh, 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 to do something that you might not want them to do so again i can see that i might have not showed you this here was it again this was the information about the um, estonian certificate authority uh, uh, this is the certificate which is installed in, on my machine um, yes and you can try and do the same thing on your machine uh, so let's go back to the slides for some final remarks right um so um so who is the, how do you become certificate authority and, and 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 how do you get a certificate so up to a few years ago it was uh, 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 the whole process around certificate authorities was a bit um i think it's fair to say that it wasn't very transparent um and of course, I mean, the people running certificate authorities are running businesses. I mean, you, you go to them and you pay them to, 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 uh, uh, to issue a certificate. Um, so those are companies that are doing businesses and, and uh, they usually, uh, historically, they were somehow connected to telecommunication companies in the different countries. I mean, certificate authorities are an essential ingredient for the internet to work. Um, but it's fair to say again, that, that, that all the procedures behind the, the, the way certificate authorities would work were not completely transparent. Um, a few years back, a number of companies and, and uh, universities and, and non-profit associations uh, created the project Let's Encrypt, which is a, um, an open source uh, certificate authority where you can get, uh, uh, where you can easily get a free certificate. Uh, uh, for instance, if you want to try and, and get a certificate for your own website, you could go on Let's Encrypt and, and, and try that. Um, um, something else that should be said about certificate authorities, of course, is that uh, the certificate authorities themselves can be hacked. Um, and sometimes this has happened. Um, so there have been some, some historical example of certificate authority getting hacked and uh, um, releasing certificates, fake certificates for, for, for important websites. So you can Google about uh, uh, and find more information about uh, hack around certificate authorities um, and this also has of course uh, 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 made that made it so that some certificate authorities that were trusted by browsers years back they're not trusted anymore and also that some certificate authorities have changed the way they they run the procedures and now they have more uh, more strict procedures for how they uh, um, issue certificates um, i think that was all i had to say about certificate authorities and uh, uh, key distribution centers in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how to protect uh, keys uh, uh, on your machines. And we're going to look at uh, tools like passwords and biometrics and hardware security and things like that. So see you soon.